Welcome to the Nick Taylor Horror Show. Jim Ojala is a special effects makeup artist, director, and co-host of my new favorite Shutter show, The Core, which is half horror talk show, half practical effects how-to with amazing guests such as Lee Wanell, the Saska sisters, and the Lord of Darkness himself, Glenn Danzig. Additionally, Jim Ojala is a trauma alum, and his latest creature feature, Strange Nature, bursts at the seams with this schlocky pedigree. Strange Nature seamlessly integrates trauma's no-holds-barred insanity with enough of a grounded storyline and authentic characters for audiences to stay engaged and take the film seriously. Overall, the movie's a great deal of fun, and it also really hits you with a very strong, timely message about the dangerous biological implications of industrialism. Anyway, really enjoyed talking to Jim, and hope you enjoy listening. So how's everything going? Uh, good, good. Just jumping right back into things. Um, yeah, the effects world has been going pretty nonstop, right, right from after Christmas. So. Is that right? Yeah. Between that and kind of keeping the strange nature promotion train going, it's uh, yeah. Oh, nice Again. man! What other kind of stuff are you guys working on, effects wise? We just finished this zombie film called Witness Infection that was actually co-produced and stars Carlos Alzraki, who was in Strange Nature. Oh, cool! And there's a bunch of great comedians that are in that. Um, we finished that up, and then we're also in the middle of a bunch of work for a couple big bands right now. Um, oh, nice. Album cover stuff, different things. Like, unfortunately, we can't talk about it right now, but it's a lot of really cool stuff. That's super up. cool, man. Always makes me happy to hear that the world of practical effects is alive and well and prosperous. Yeah, I, I really feel like things have, the dust has settled to a certain extent where people are getting more comfortable with, like, okay, practical effects has its place mm-hmm. and VFX has its place. And and they're kind of going to survive together. You yeah. Know? Yeah. And I think that's the ideal scenario. And I think a lot of uh, major directors are really outspoken about it. And I think that's helping. Like Joe Dante talks about it all the time. Guillermo del Toro talks about how you, you kind of need both, but build as much practically as you can and just outfit stuff with CG as needed. I mean, it's and uh, what's his name? James Wan did most as he, as he, he did as much of Aquaman practically as he could have. That was a crazy yeah. movie, but he didn't have to build those those fishman creature suits but he chose to which i thought was pretty cool so yeah, yeah it seems like it's all evening itself out Definitely. yeah well cool man let's talk uh, strange nature that was a lot a lot of fun first of all by the way so oh, thanks. thanks for sending it and thanks for a good time how uh, how did the movie come about um well i'm from minnesota and this this real life phenomenon of these deformed frog outbreaks started happening in the mid 90s well, I was still in high school there, and it, you know, you see on the front page of your newspaper all these mutant frogs with extra misplaced limbs, misplaced eyeballs, all this crazy stuff. And it's like, oh, this is happening in our backyard. Right. And um, so I kind of like that, that always had been stemmed in my mind. And then when I was trying to get my first feature going in the early 2000s, I kind of like checked in on that again, like, what's going on with that scenario? And found out it's still happening. It wasn't completely solved. Oh, my God. And I was like, wow, this is like amazing fodder for like a sci-fi eco-thriller horror film. So um, that kind of that kind of stemmed it all. And then I started reaching out to the scientific community and actually got a lot of support for Strange Nature because mm-hmm. they feel screwed over by not only the news media, but the government as well for kind of just dropping the ball on this. And kind of brushing it under the carpet after most of the funding was pulled in like 2001. Hmm. And there's been just very isolated research on it since then, even though it's still happening and actually moving across the country. Oh, my God. So this is this issue is spreading. This is real. This is real. Like the, like what started as the biggest hotspot in America, in Minnesota, where I'm from, has now spread to one of the biggest hotspots is Northern California now. In 2013, they found a population in Oregon that was 100% malformed. Oh, 100%. That's never happened in history before. And just Every, frogs. Just frogs. Every Sometimes you'll find them in salamanders and other wetland creatures, but mainly frogs. 
And uh, yeah, every one they pulled out of this population, out of this wetland, had some kind of malformation. So it's not going away, it's just moving and mutating, for lack of a better term. Oh know? my God, do they have any idea what is causing it? Obviously, it's all industrial related, but... Yeah, there's, there's a lot of theories. I mean, the main theory is the one that we kind of mostly go into in Strange Nature, which is parasites, evasive parasites brought in hmm. by algae blooms caused by fertilizer and pesticide overspray leaking into wetlands, causing these unnatural algae blooms that bring in all these snails that have this parasite. And basically the parasite gets into the water because the host or because the snail gets so close to the water and then the parasite goes out, finds a developing tadpole, burrows into its limb buds and basically purposely handicaps it. Whoa. So as the limbs grow, instead of forming one regular arm, it might form four arms. They're all gimpy. That's and so they, insane. Yeah, and it can't move right. Therefore, uh, uh, you know, a, a bird can easily swoop down, pick it up. And then the life cycle, the parasite continues in the feces of the bird, gets dropped down on shore, and the whole vicious cycle starts again. Wow. This is definitely like out of a, the first Alien movie. <laughs> it's a xenomorph kind of shit. Ooh, it's totally so cool. insane, though. Yeah. I mean, I, I know some people in – sorry, yeah. what? No, I'm saying that the world I, – I did a lot of studying and research on parasites getting into this film, too. And the, just the world of parasites is – it's essential to mankind, but it's so vicious, too. Isn't there a parasite that apparently I think it takes – I think when it affects a bird, it can affect its mind and it can literally control the bird's mind Yes, like a it, zombie parasite. Exactly. And it also happens in rats too. It's this thing called toxoplasma which basically causes the, the rat to run towards danger. It will actually run towards a cat. Holy to shit basically out of control and because the parasite screws with its brain to to basically kill it off so it can continue its life cycle in the feces of the cat then and then get Holy picked shit. up by a rat again and go and there, there, there's this crazy theory that soccer players in brazil were actually infected by toxoplasma which makes them such badass soccer players <laughs> Fearless, do they run to danger because they're infected by this parasite? Which is just, it's this bizarre theory, but I've actually seen that. Yeah. Oh my God. They should give it to UFC fighters. Right, exactly. Yeah. That's so ins That's terrifying, though. That's really, really insane. It's yeah. not known for sure where reality meets fiction in this world. Yeah. Know? Well, how's the response been for the film from the scientific community? Um, Really good. We've actually gotten a bunch of kudos. In fact, we recently had a, um, uh, a uh, science teacher that, that thought a lot of the science and it was really sound and was interested in starting to host it in like high school Whoa. science classes, like screenings of it. And he's like, you know, there's some F-bombs and there's some like gore and stuff, but we might be able to kind of squeak around some of that. To oh, actually come on, show it. Don't censor it. Right, exactly. <laughs> I mean, we watched, you know, Stand and Deliver and all that in high school, and there's full of F-bombs and all that and colors and all that, so, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I like that it had kind of an Aaron Brockovich element to it, having the women going and investigating this all, and then you you throughout the course of the movie learn more and more about the science, and yeah, it really made it feel, it felt, feel very real, and it was clear that this is all based on fact, and that right. this is really okay. happening, and like it definitely felt like a movie with a message, like no, that this is this is all really happening. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you can get just people talking about it all, or just investigating, hmm, did that really happen? That's where we start the film with all that real news footage mm -hmm. to kind of establish that, like, no, Ted Koppel was talking about this on national news in '96. Like this mm -hmm. happened, you know? So, yeah. Other than the frogs, were there any other? Like how how much of the other elements were true? Were there dogs that were affected or anything like that? Uh, no, no, no. I, I can start to take that world and run with it. Yeah. However, while we were in pre production in Minnesota, a wolf had attacked some campers and bitten them badly, and they captured the wolf. And it, it's it's so it's so out of line. Wolves don't do that in yeah. real life. Like they don't do that. So it was very bizarre. And they captured the wolf. They investigated it and found out the wolf was deformed and its mouth was all like malformed and twisted up so that it probably couldn't capture its food 
it's a normal food, so it start going after whatever it could go after. Whoa. So I was like, wow, that's kind of timely, you know? Yeah, they'd have to be so starving in, in, to, to get to that because they're my, like most animals, they're gonna run away. You know, they're not. Yeah, crocodiles, that's crocodiles pretty. Crocodiles will eat you instantly. That's right, with no hesitation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that the um, some of the the creature makeup in there looks really really awesome. You and your company obviously did all of it, right? Yes, yes, we we developed it over a course of time. Like as we were just you know trying to raise money and doing pre production and talking to investors, we would do that along the way. So no matter what happened, the train was for us was always moving, and we'd always have something to show. We'd have eye candy. We would show that we've got skin in the game. You know. So we would develop that over the time. Then Steve Adkins, um, Lauren Wild, there were like my heads of my team that went out to, from LA and kind of headed it up. And I would kind of like supervise and try to keep my hands off it as much as possible. But I was still there at three in the morning, you know, like painting some wolf hair or whatever, you know. So it's uh, um, the crazy thing though is we originally we were going to make effects frogs and we were trying to figure out like how do we do this? How do we make this small? mutant frog that moves the right way. How do you fit servos in this little body? All these things. And then it dawned on me. I was like, wait a minute. It's a real issue. Maybe we could get the real thing. So when we started reaching out to the scientific community, we got the leading U.S. consultant or leading U.S. Um, ecologist that's on these cases to be our consultant. And through those channels, we were able to get the live deformed frogs. Holy shit. So all the frogs you see in the film are real. They're real live frogs that we took care of for years to basically showcase them in the film. Oh, that's fucking crazy. Yeah, because I knew that the frogs were real and I knew that they were the real. I know you didn't attach like prosthetic limbs to them. But what I assumed you did was take footage from the frogs and replicate the footage in on the set. But no, you had the real frogs and you were keeping them, raising them. You probably gave them all names. Yeah, we did. If you look at the credits, there's just this big chunk of the credits. <laughs> all their all their names are listed in there. Giz That's Bud, awesome. All of them and Bud, the big the big um, toad that you see with the arm sticking out of his side in the classroom scene, he's still alive and he actually attended the Duluth, Minnesota premiere as a guest of honor. That is awesome. <laughs> Well, that's really interesting that you made a point to to make the effects and make the creatures from the beginning, it sounds like, so you could show investors that this was moving along and that you had something tangible. Well, yeah. And like I, I've known so many struggling filmmakers you know, through the years as a makeup and creature effects artist, which is my bread and butter. That's what I do professionally. And it was like, okay, well, usually it's a guy with a script and maybe a business plan and not much more than that. So it's like, okay, this is at least something else tangible that I can bring to the table mm -hmm. and show, okay, I've got something else to offer. You know, I'm not just a guy with an idea. I also have, you know, all these skills that can bring this at like basically no cost, you know? Yeah. No, that's super. It makes all the sense in the world because yeah, usually when people pitch a movie, they have a screenplay and they have an idea and a wink and a prayer. And, but to show that you actually are, are working on something, or that you have something tangibly done, I would imagine that that, that must really help getting your Huge. film sold. Like with the, I mean, even though this film isn't centered around the effects, there is enough in this film that if we would have had to pay an effects house to make these for us, we'd still be trying to raise the money. Yeah. We couldn't have made this film if, unless we did it ourselves. Gotcha. Yeah. Look, they look pretty awesome. Especially that two faced wolf that's on the cover. That thing looked amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. That's Finale, yeah. yeah, really cool. And I like that. And tell me if 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 I'm right in this or not. I like the kind of homage to the howling when she brings that mutant dog on live on the live news. Was that a nod to the howling? Um, it actually wasn't, but I do love the howling. So all these things kind of, I'm sure, kind of crept in here and there. So. The subconsciously, we're doing that. Yeah, that's awesome. I just started in public access um, in Minnesota. That's how I got my start. Oh and yeah, that's right. And I sent a copy to Troma and they kind of gave me my start um, based on this this little horror comedy show I had. So I wanted a scene in the film that took place back at the original public access studio where I started in Minnesota. And I figured, too, like it makes sense if this woman can't get any attention, she's getting ignored by the newspaper, the, the mayor, like the regular media. Where else do you go? Like, hey, maybe you could get an interview on public access. So it's it felt like the natural like progression. Yeah. Know? 
No, that's really, really cool. One thing I loved reading about was your, the way that you pitched Lloyd Kaufman from Troma. Could you tell that story? Because I feel like there's a lot of really, really good learnings in that. Like you sent him a package, but you did it in a way that, that really got his attention. Yeah, I, I originally sent Troma a, um, a, a copy of like what I thought was our best episode of My Three Scums, our horror comedy show, and never heard anything back. So it's okay. You know, they probably get this crap all the time. So let's do something that's, that I know they have to see. So I get the j- biggest computer box I can find. Huge, like Gateway 2000 box or whatever. And uh, we put a copy of, of our episode in there. We, I write a letter to Lloyd Kaufman and, you know, just expressing my interest in working with them. And uh, the rest of the box we fill with flyers from the show and helium balloons with I love my three scums and all this written all over them. So he opens the box, boom, all these balloons fly everywhere in the office. You have to notice that. Even if you hate our show, I know you're going to notice that. So um, a month later, we get a letter from Lloyd saying, yeah, you're a really talented filmmaker. I dig my three scums. Thank you for the balloons. And you're, if you're ever in Hell's Kitchen, hit me up. So I instantly book a, um, a plane ticket because at that time, I'm filing medical record charts at a hospital in Minnesota. And quite honestly, because I, I couldn't afford to go to film school or get grants or anything. So I figured I would do my thing on the weekends and I would probably file medical record charts for the rest of my life. And I go out there and I meet with Lloyd and like – no matter what you think of those guys, this guy's the president of the longest running independent film studio. He drops everything and hangs out with me in his office for half an hour. And we just shoot the shit. And basically he, at the end of it, he offers me an intern position on toxic Avenger four, which is going to be coming up in the next couple months. I go back, I quit my job. I cash out my savings and I move to hell's kitchen and let's see what happens. And, Luckily, the second day on the job, I got in with the effects department and uh, Tim Constantine, the head of the company, took me under his wing and the rest was history. That's awesome. And what was it like working, working with Troma? Um, it's where everybody should start. because It shows you what you're made of. Um, if you are weak at all, Troma will destroy you like completely. I mean, we're talking – three, four hours of sleep a night, maybe for six weeks, people like eating out of garbage bags. I mean, it's just like, like it's so, so tough. Um, but you're also encouraged to kind of like think on your feet and add ideas to scenes and all these things. So, um, it's, a uh, it's like the ultimate boot camp. but once you get out of that, if you survive and I saw like half the crew crack and like not make it all the way through, But if you make it all the way through, like you'll never in a million years ever work on something as hard as a trauma film. So it's really, literally, you can only go up from there. Whoa. I had no idea that they were that, uh, that they were that grueling considering that they're mostly low budget and seem relatively simple to make, but not the case. Style, guerrilla style, running in locations. I mean, we were doing insane, insane offensive scenes in public parks and then running out as we're getting death threats and bomb threats at the production office. I mean, you know, I mean, it's just insane. Like I can't even, yeah. Some of the stuff I can't even describe to you on screen, you know? So it's just, <laughs> it's like, I, I would encourage anybody that's interested, check out Citizen Toxie, Toxic Avenger 4, check out the DVD and there's a two disc set and the, the apocalypse soon, the making of, it kind of outlines a lot of that and you see the warts and all and it's, it's badass. That's yeah. awesome. Really, really cool. How long were you there for? Um, I worked on Toxy and Tim uh, basically offered me a full-time assistant position by the time the movie was over. So after that, then I worked on some Broadway stuff with him. I worked on Larry Fessenden's Wendigo with him and then a little SNL. And then after that, I moved to um, L.A. And that's where I got on Buffy the Vampire Slayer and Angel and some of those projects. So, um, yeah, I was only in New York like two and a half years. Nice. So what were some of or what was the overall process like for getting Strange Nature funded and made? And I mean, after the inception of the idea, what were some of your next steps and how long did it take? And what, what was the process like to get the whole thing done? 
I mean, we did like immediately we did a publicity event in Minnesota that got some interest, but we got on the news and all these things, but we didn't get, um, we didn't get financing. So we kept, we came back to LA and we tried to get financing here. Things would come and go. It was tricky because we were like a mixed bag film. It wasn't like straight ahead horror film. It was, you know, kind of drama meets thriller meets horror. So that scares a lot of investors, a lot of producers away because they don't know how to put it in a box. Um, so that, you know, and, and that was something I wasn't really willing to compromise on. Like I wanted to make this thing that I felt was more complex and interesting to me um, and stay true to the story. Like one producer wanted to make it aliens at the end of it. And I was just like, we're never going to talk again. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, um, at one point we were fully financed from producers that I was doing a horror film. My company was doing the effects on a horror film in Iowa and and Iowa for a while was trying to become like the new Hollywood where they had this insane incentive, 50% back. So when you were done filming and within 90 days, you got a check for 50% back on all production expenses, Whoa. like more than any other state. So like productions were flocking there like crazy. So the producers of this film I was on, they financed Strange Nature to go into pre-production immediately when the film was done that I was working on there. And I was like, holy crap, it's finally going to happen. So we're, we're starting to roll. And then as we're finishing up the horror film that I'm working on, the governor of Iowa steps in and investigates the film program and the film commissioner and find out it's all corrupt. Uh. Producers are coming there. And they're getting all these kickbacks. They're greasing the film commissioner for like, oh, I bought a Mercedes Benz. Let's call it a production vehicle. Now the state of Iowa, the taxpayers owe me 50% back on the Benz that I just bought. There was something like over 3 million in bullshit expenses. Oh, man. So they shut the whole thing down and... The, the, my film goes away again and we're right back to square one. So like these, these just crazy roads would happen. And luckily once something like Kickstarter, um, happened, we did a Kickstarter campaign and that was successful. So that really got us going and we still had to, we needed way more money than what we raised on Kickstarter, but I knew that it was a realistic amount that we could raise if we worked our asses off. We got it. And then based on the strength of that, I was able to raise the rest of the film and then self-finance some. And then we were off and running. Nice. What were some of the keys to, to run in a successful Kickstarter campaign for your, for a movie like this? A lot of people that I know that have done Kickstarter campaigns with campaigns that I've seen, they really take it for granted where they kind of, they might do a nice video and then they kind of expect it and do a couple posts and then they expect it to just take off. No, like it's more than a full-time job in my experience. Like I couldn't even work really during that whole promotion period. Like you have to around the clock be contacting every website, every blogger, every, every Twitter account, anything that has to do in my case with horror films and get them on your side, get them to repost it. And then like, oh, just doing a Facebook um, update for instance, no, people can ignore that or act like they ignored it. So you have to go in there and let's say you have 2000 friends on Facebook. You have to go in and message each one of them individually seeing their name in the message. So they know it's not like a BS cut and paste. It's like you're reaching out to them personally. They can't ignore it. They know that you saw that, that you saw it. Um, so like all those things, they took an incredible amount of time, but it counted. And it, and it made it up in the end. What was your video like? Did you, I mean, you must've shown off the practical effects yeah. and we, we showed off the practical effects. Um, Carl Zell's Racky, who, you know, rock from Mo Rocco's modern life to Reno 911. He's got a fan base. He did a little cameo. Um, and then, uh, and then it was really just about really pushing the use of practical effects and the fact that it was based on this real life ecological unsolved mystery. Um, like those mm. were the big selling points. And then also we were able to get a lot of strength from Minnesota too. Like we went back to Minnesota and like the city I'm from in Duluth, like we shot the mayor scene in the real mayor's office. Like the mayor of Duluth got on the, the nightly news, told the whole city 
to get behind me and to support this project. Like all of those things mattered. Uh, wow. So it's just, you just, you can't even take an hour off if you expect it to be successful. Yeah. If it's not successful and you didn't work that hard, you only have yourself to blame. Right. Now that makes a whole world of sense. Yeah. And I see people doing that all the time. They launch something on Kickstarter and they think it'll just go viral. Exactly. No, not quite. No. <laughs> and another, and, and speaking of the, the genre world, the horror world, another big thing that helped us when we would reach out to independent sites and bloggers and all this, um, the fact that they felt like we were doing something different um, made a huge impact. We weren't, we weren't making another ghost film another home invasion film, another possession film. They felt like, okay, this is something I haven't really seen in a while at least. So we got a lot of support strictly because of that as well. That's cool. Were people really getting behind the fact that it was practically driven, that it was driven by practical effects? Was that a major selling point on Kickstarter? Yeah, that was, that was. Anybody that was a part of that, um, that, that's interested in that world, I... Obviously, I have a lot of friends in the practical effects world that also shared it and spread the word. Um, yeah, all that made a – it did make a significant difference. Nice. So having made the movie and spent the time that you spent on it and, and looking at it retrospectively, what would you have spent more on and what would you have spent less on? I don't necessarily mean money, but it could be time, energy, focus, whatever, or money. Um, having seen the finished product, what would you have spent less on and what would you have spent more on? Um, the – Probably the one of the biggest lessons for me um, is I would have I would have brought out an AD from LA, an assistant director that I've worked with that I knew and trusted because like we had a grueling shoot, we had an 18 day shoot, tons of locations, tons of characters. Like it was there was days we had three company moves in one day, and we'd still have to make our day. So the original assistant director that we had, he cracked and he couldn't do it and he quit on us like on day four basically and like that anybody that's made an independent film like an ambitious independent film knows how important a strong idea is we're scrambling we're scrambling and we we pull in our script supervisor kathy because she's like assistant directed a short film before and she did a great job and she did her best but that like really threw us for a loop and you start to lose some of the confidence of people and like I just knew we had to keep shooting no matter what. Don't take time to panic. Just don't stop shooting. So I, that would have been a, a huge plus if I would have brought an AD that I already knew that I could have pre-planned with from LA. That would have been a big deal. And another thing I would have changed is I would have taken a really super, super hard look before we started shooting at the finished script and really been, and been really tough with myself do I need every one of these scenes? Are they absolutely essential to the finished film? Because there's a lot of scenes we ended up cutting, but we spent a ton of money and time shooting. And that would have made a world of difference. Because if, like, look, for instance, if we would have had all that time that we shot those scenes that ended up on the cutting room floor, we could have actually had time to do rehearsals. We didn't have time to do any rehearsals. We would do a quick blocking and we would shoot. And like that, like those kind of things would have made a massive difference. So that's a big thing I would encourage people. Like I know everybody thinks their script is genius and it's their baby and it's brilliant the way it is, but take a hard look and, and see if there's anything you could possibly cut out before you start shooting. Cool. And get a, uh, get an AD who you can throw in a battle, obviously. Okay, that you know, that you know. Like if, if you're if you're lucky enough to already be working in the entertainment industry, like you've probably already worked with ADs. So like somebody that you already know and then know that like can can handle it, like get that guy or that girl. Yeah. Right? Awesome. Um, so in the world of filmmaking and directing and screenwriting, there's a lot of resources out there. There's a lot of books, there's courses, a lot of which are done by people or written by people who haven't actually made a film. So there's like a lot of the market is just loaded with a lot of how to bullshit for aspiring filmmakers. That being said, was there anything that you came across either courses or books that, that you, that helped you significantly along your way that you'd recommend? Yes, actually there's two books that were incredibly helpful. Uh, Save the Cat, and Your Screenplay Sucks. Both of those I found incredibly helpful. 
So I would nice. I would highly recommend those to anybody. And then and also right now I'm I I just finished writing a um uh a, a kind of a sci-fi thriller TV series that I'm pitching as well as I'm in the middle of writing my next feature too. And I'm I'm uh, watching uh, Aaron Sorkin's uh, Masterclass, and I'm also finding that very helpful. So nice, really cool. Uh, last couple of questions here. So the state of horror has been, it's been pretty interesting. Obviously horror goes up. The horror as an industry goes up during times of social unrest. And it's what we're dealing with right now. Uh, as far as the overall horror landscape, what have you seen in the past couple of years that's really excited you? Um, I mean, I thought, I really thought Get Out was, it was incredible because we needed something that, that on the, on the racial landscape that really um, was tough you know, and was in, and had some, some heart to it and could be, uh, could be a little mean, you know? And I thought that was like perfect for this time. You know, that was, that was a big one for me. Um, and, uh, yeah, as far as, um, other films right now, um, yeah, I mean, that's the, that's kind of the big one that would, that stands out right now. Um, I, uh, I also really liked um, Trent Haggai. I liked his his film Sixty Eight Kill that came out last year. He's another trauma alumni. Um, that was that was a film that just like just from like a, a nice like lower class. I like I like seeing films about lower class people, working class people. I feel like you don't see enough of that sometimes. Um, just like his film Dead Girl that I worked on. Um, that was like that was about kids that you don't want to admit exist, but they do. And just because you want to brush them under the carpet, their stories still need to be told because these are potentially dangerous people. Like, um, actually another one in the, in that kind of that world, um, is we need to talk about Kevin with Tilda Swinton. I thought it was incredibly powerful. Cause like, whoa, like we're, we are in this, this weird world where everybody's debating what creates a mass shooter. What's create, what creates a normal kid to become, grow up to be a killer? And I thought that film did an incredible job of watching a child from toddler to distraught teenager. And are there signs along the way, things that parents potentially ignore because they're not my kid? They're in that not my kid would do this frame of mind. And I thought that like those, those kind of, um, topics and, uh, confrontations, I think are really important. Nice. I got to check that one out. What is the other one called dovetail or dove girl? Oh, dead girl. Oh, dead girl. Okay. Got it. <laughs> it's totally off. No. Oh, it's, <laughs> I did the makeup effects on it. Um, it blew up at Toronto, uh, years ago and it, it was really great for all of us. And it's really disturbing subject matter, but done incredibly well, incredibly tasteful, but it is disturbing and not a date movie. So don't, don't mistake it. I had a lot of friends like, dude, why did you tell me what that movie was about? I was sitting there with my like fiance, like now she thinks you're a scumbag. You know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Duly noted yeah. that one. I'll watch on my own then yeah, yeah. for sure. Right. Well, cool. So what are you working on next? Um, I am, I'm working on this uh, sci-fi thriller series that I'm, I'm pitching, Uncanny Valley, um, as well as um, my new feature script, which is, I can't say too much about it, but it involves class warfare and bed bugs. So, it, um, yeah, it's guaranteed to kind of get under your skin. So it's, it's kind of an interesting world that I'm, I'm kind of diving into. Um, but yeah, that's and that's that's one that we may also be bringing back to Minnesota potentially. Um, oh, nice. They just got some of their film incentives re revamped, so we'll see. Um, and then also we're finishing up this project with John Hennigan, who is the pro wrestler, Johnny Morrison, that was in Strange Nature, um, called The Iron Sheik Massacre. And that's like that's going to be coming out later this year, and uh, like I can't tell you. And yes, the real Iron Sheik is involved, and it's it's amazing. It's going to be shit. Yeah, bonkers. It's, it's so – it's like one of those like dream projects as an effects guy and everything. And it's just, it's so cool. Oh man, so, that sounds great. Cool. So that's, that's going to be coming up soon. And, um, and then also, um, yeah. And then just strange nature is out there now. It's on Amazon prime. You can get it at Redbox. You can order the DVD on Amazon or walmart.com. 
So, yeah, just uh, kind of pushing all those worlds. Awesome. And it's on iTunes too, right? Yes, and it's on yes. iTunes. And if anybody has Shudder, um, the horror channel Shudder, we have a show on Shudder called The Core. Yes, which, yes. Uh, yes, I, I co-hosted and I co-produced. Um, Mickey Keating is the, the host and Gabe Roth, Eli Roth's brother, produced it. And it's so awesome. It's like we had Elijah Wood. We had the Soska sisters, Glenn Danzig on as guests. I'm a huge Misfits fan. Oh, really? But yeah, that seems super cool. Yeah, he, it's, it's, like, it's like one of the most in-depth interviews he's ever given about his inspirations, favorite horror movies, right down to like how he would – create the posters for the misfits and why he chose certain colors. I mean, it's, it's really fascinating. That's awesome. Really, really cool. He does some pretty gnarly things too in there. Yeah. So, Isn't he yeah. doing his own movie? Yes. Which I don't know if I can talk about, but oh, okay. I, I did help him with a little bit. So oh, nice. He announced it. So I just can't talk about any particulars of it, but that's going to be super cool too. It's something he's been trying to get going for a long time. That's awesome. I can only imagine what the hell he comes up with. You just listen to the song lyrics. You'd like, we're going to be in for a world of pain. Exactly. Exactly. Nice. Yeah. No, he's a cool guy. Well, cool, man. This, uh, I really, really appreciate it. This was a lot of fun and, uh, congrats on strange nature. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, of course. Um, so, yeah. um, and then, yeah. And then, you know, People can find more about the film on strangenaturemovie.com and we're on Instagram at Strange Nature Movie. And then we have a Facebook page as well. Nice. So. And how do people, what's the best way for people to stay in touch with you and follow you online? Twitter, um, Instagram? Yeah, go to, yeah, Instagram um, at Ojala FX, O J A L A F X. And then um, there is also at Jim Ojala. Uh, for the personal page and um and then we're on twitter at jim Ojula and um at strange nature great strange one is the twitter cool cool man good talking to you all right take care all right i'll see you all right lots of great insights here let's begin with jim ojala's keys for aspiring indie filmmakers number one show progress as he was raising funds for Strange Nature, Jim was already building the creatures. Investors and producers were excited to see something real and tangible to indicate that the film was really happening. More often than not, filmmakers have nothing but a script or an idea, but to have something, anything, that shows that you're already working on your film is super helpful when it comes to pitching producers. In Jim's case, he was already building the creatures for his movie, so he had some very cool stuff to show producers to get them excited. Number two, use your own skills as much as you can. Jim and his creature effects company, Ojala Productions, made all of the mutant animals except for the deformed frogs, which were real. This enabled his low-budget movie to look and feel way more expensive. If Jim had tried to hire a company to make all of his creatures, he'd still be trying to raise money, as he said. Damien Leone did a similar thing when he made all the effects for Terrifier, by the way. Low-budget filmmaking requires that you wear many hats. Figure out which of your personal skills will contribute best to the film's production value and triple down on that. Number three, take a hard look at your script. Jim recounts that there were many scenes and sequences from Strange Nature that he had to cut from the final film because they just didn't work. This was super painful for him since those sequences were costly and time-consuming. Jim recommends that you edit your script mercilessly before you start shooting and shoot only what you need when you're working on a limited budget. This saves you lots of time, energy, and headaches later down the line. Number four, get a strong AD. Jim's first AD, assistant director, cracked under the pressure of indie filmmaking and bailed on him four days into production on Strange Nature. This set him back significantly. Indie filmmaking requires a different breed of AD, specifically people with the flexibility, resilience, and resourcefulness to handle the ups and downs that come with low-budget filmmaking. It's imperative for indie directors to find proven indie ADs who can weather the storms with them. This is a huge concept. Number five, work at Troma. Jim went so far as to state that Troma is where all aspiring filmmakers should start because it's incredibly grueling and forces you to toughen up in all of the ways directors need to be tough. It's also an exciting, fun, and highly collaborative environment. 
Jim's description of his time at Trauma is comparable to a military hell week, but it's the kind of experience that gives your indie filmmaking spirit the resolve of a Navy SEAL. If you can work for Trauma, work for Trauma. They're based in New York. Anyway, guys, thank you again, as always, for listening to the Nick Taylor Horror Show. If you enjoyed this episode, it would mean the world to me if you could share it with your friends and family on social media. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or wherever you listen. Thank you again for listening to the Nick Taylor Horror Show. We scare because we care. <laughs>